Um, so I'd like to call to order the Long Run House and Authority Board of Commissioners regular meeting this Tuesday, June 13th, 2023 at 725. Um, we have roll call things. Uh, I'll start with me, Joan Peck, Chair. Uh, Susie Lawwood Ferry, Commissioner. Marsha Martin, Commissioner. Mayor Rodriguez, Commissioner. Tim Lunders, Commissioner. Harold Dominguez, Harriman, Executive Director. Andrew Daniels, County Supervisor. Molly O'Donnell, Housing Director. Eric Myers, Assistant. Sarah Ray, Public Safety. Lisa Yana, Regional Manager. Sean McCoy, Commissioner. Tim Wallace, Assistant City Attorney. Okay, um, looks like we're all here. We need to review and approve the, the May 16th minutes. Can I have a motion? I move we uh, approve the minutes as presented. Second. So that's been uh, moved by the approval of the May 16th minutes, has been moved by Commissioner McCoy, seconded by Commissioner Fidel Ferry. We are now at public invited to be heard. Yeah. Oh, we have to vote. Yeah. Oh, let's vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed. So that passes unanimously. We're now at public invited to be heard. Is there anybody from the public that would like to speak? We're Strider. Wanted to speak. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Did Just, you want to speak? Um, Ask a question? Yeah, well. And your name? Uh, my name is Stan Cole. And uh, I'm having problems of being um, putting into a second class citizenship because of the type of address I have. And some places are denying services, and um, I don't really know who, if it's, they're saying the city is putting pressure on him to do this, and then some people in the city says, no, that's just a private group doing that. And um, it doesn't quite make sense to me. And so. At the point right now, I'm just trying to figure out where exactly this is coming from and who's pressuring who. That, so anyway, that's where I'm at right there. Okay, thank you, Stan. Um, we're now at old uh, new business, appointment of a deputy secretary. Uh, yeah, so I'll speak to that. So when we actually got into the closing, uh, element on Zinnia. Mm -hmm. uh, based on some of the financing models, there was a point where they needed somebody to attest to my signature that it was actually me that had an office with the housing authority. And so the way that it's structured is that uh, fortunately the chair came in that day and it, it was like, well, I know that the chair is going to be in, but it's just a signature line for the chair. But as we were moving to closing, had you not been coming in that day, it created an issue. So our proposal is to create a deputy secretary of the housing authority, which is Erica. And then in the sense when we're signing these documents where somebody has to attest that it's me signing it, we can do it. We tried to say, well, why don't we just get a notary? Well, it's not a notary that you need in there. It's actually an officer of the organization. So that's why we're putting this on, is to have Erica in that position so that she can attest to my signature and we, for the life of all of us, don't know why that's in play, but it was in play in that deal. Um, Jim, that? That's fine. Right. Do we need a motion yes. to do that? Do you have a question? I do. Okay. Who's the secretary? You're the secretary. <laughs> I mean, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's the way that that's the way that it's always been created. Is that the executive director? My position is the secretary, and so we instead of mangling everything to try to redo it, we thought that the easiest solution right now is to say we can create a deputy secretary. Just around been around this for six years and didn't know you were the secretary. <laughs> I'm going to have to appoint Erica Mendez as the deputy secretary. Second. I have a question. Yes. 
Erica, are you fine with that? <laughs> 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 I already notarized the signature, so <laughs> you <Yeah. laughs> Good question. Uh, so that uh, motion to nominate, um, no, to move that Eric would be the deputy secretary uh, has been moved by Commissioner um, Rodriguez and seconded by Commissioner Martin. Martin. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed? That passes. Yes. And congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> So, we have Resolution 2023-20, the ratification of the formation of Walmart Housing Authority Ventures, LLC. So, Molly O'Donnell, Housing Director, I'll go ahead and open up this item. Um, if you recall, back on the May 21st City Council meeting where you adjourned and, and opened up the LHA board to make this um, special item go through, um, we created LHA Ventures LLC uh, as a limited liability company for the partnerships in which we, from this point on and going forward, would be a special limited partner only, not necessarily in the <clears throat> co-development role or the ownership structure other than this special limited partner. The special limited partner role is really, because we're a housing authority, affordable housing developers want us to come in in that ownership structure so that they can qualify for tax exemption and, and some benefits and make sure the housing authority also has a network that is really the you know the center of the web of, of affordable housing in Lama. So we ended up creating that late in the game on Zinnia at the advice of our special counsel, um, which Tim also was involved in and everyone agreed that this was a smart idea on Christmas 2, back a year ago, we entered as an SLP as the LHA. And legal advice um, is telling us that if we create an LLC that is designated for that SLP relationship and use that on Zinnia and then future SLP only relationships going forward, it would um, just reduce the LHA's liability when they're entering into those partnerships. Tim, do you have it? Supplemental information yeah, for that. A couple things to add. One thing that's different about Chrisman and Zinnia. Chrisman, we were uh, more general partners in that deal. That's um, right. Whereas Zinnia, we were in that deal mostly for a special, a special limited partnership. Um, and so the negotiations uh, kind of centered around at that point um, guarantees from somebody who was going to have actual assets to protect us in the case that some liability got the LHA. Um, and the uh, uh, partnership wasn't willing to, to put somebody who actually had pockets to, to guarantee us. Um, so adding an entity allowed us to give up the buffer space between any, any potential liability. Um, another thing to add is the housing authority law that explicitly allows the housing authority in one of the enumerated uh, authorizations of the housing authority, you're allowed to create entities that are controlled um, and operated by the housing authority to act and invest as a partner in the partnerships and take any steps necessary to be kind of other, otherwise developed for a, a project. So the idea in the housing authority law was this. They, 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 they set up the law so that we could do this. And then in the tax exemption, they explicitly allowed that as tax exemption to flow through an entity that was wholly owned by the housing authority. Um, and so the sole purpose will be to hold those special limited partnerships. So we're not going to put something that's real ownership stake in, in, a, in, a, in a related property. It'll just be those 0.001%, 0.01% special limited partnerships that is just for the tax exemption to the project. And so we can use that on any project that we, that we have going forward. So it would be the same. Okay. So I recall that there were questions potentially about um, the the taxing status of the entity. Do we want to address those? Um, sure, the, the entity is a limited liability company. I think there was questions last meeting about whether or not it was a nonprofit or, or a for-profit company. Um, it, it is technically a for-profit company uh, and not a nonprofit. Um, that is the way those are uh, always set up. That was the way it was set up as uh, on advice of our special counsel. Uh, 
still think it would actually qualify for a for a nonprofit status for what it does. Um, but all it is is a pass through entity. So um, for IRS purposes, it's a disregarded entity, uh, and the money goes. So there is a fee for us entering a special limited partnership that goes straight to the housing authority, and then the ownership interest is held by the by this company. This company doesn't actually receive any assets, and I think in all of the deals, there's no like residual asset that would flow to this. Yeah. So we're we're the sole corporate partner or member, sole member, which makes us the governing board mm -hmm. of the LLC. Yeah. yeah. Makes the housing authority the government. Yeah, exactly. It's a sole owner and member manager. Okay, yeah, can I have a motion to uh, move this resolution? So moved. Second. Okay, resolution 2023-20. Just moved by Commissioner Mayor Martin, seconded by Commissioner Hidalgo. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? So, remember this conversation because we're going to start building on this conversation related to the, the next few items that are coming forward. Okay. Thanks for that, Tesla. <laughs> <laughs> Just, it's, yeah, well, it's, it's, it's oh. okay. Okay. So now we're at resolution 2023-21 to include the Atwood Commons Property Tax Exemption Partnership. That sounds complicated. Um, so, Again, here, Molly again. So we're going to be talking about a, an affordable housing project, a proposed affordable housing project that would not be owned by LHA. We, it would be more similar to the Zinnia setup where we are a special limited partner if, this, if the board decides to do so. And then um, we'd be looking at being a third party property manager. So this is very similar to the Zinnia setup. Atwood Commons is 72 one and two bedroom units that are proposed at the corner of 3rd and Atwood. So there's, a, I think, a little gas in that there right now, and then the rest of the oh, land right. is, is um, mm -hmm. paved or, or dirt. Um, so there's a longtime Longmont developer that's had an option to purchase that property. Um, they were looking at market rentals, market for sale, and then eventually wanted to enter the LIHTC realm and um, see how see how that goes. And also, it is a good financing setup for this specific uh, deal. Part, so, of that, part of that, you know, I think when the project initially came forward, um, there was a lot of consternation regarding parking and other issues. One of the things that we also know about uh, affordable housing projects is that when you look at the parking, the park, what we see in parking is all of our affordable housing is that it is lower than market rate. And so when our transportation, when our staff looked at parking at Christman 1, which is very similar to this, it actually had, was parked at a much lower level than what we would typically see at um, normal market rate units. And so that was another piece that started making sense as we were just looking at the deal in a holistic way. And this might be happening again when I get to our new other project as well, where people are looking at converting to light tech. Um, Molly, how many units did you? 72, one and two bedrooms. Um, and so they are pretty far through the entitlement process. They do plan on putting in for a tax credit application August 1st. And in order, they have to get some ducks in a row to be able to do that. One of those is proposing to you all a property tax exemption partnership. Um, at this point, really what they need is just a commitment that we would enter into a partnership. Um, in the past, what we would do is, for Christmas specifically is, is the model, we would bring forward a property tax exemption partnership concept with the fee built in and the um, the fee is based on you know the, the affordability of the project and uh, several factors and then you would commit to that as a partnership and then when we're preparing for closing we would have a, have an actual resolution outlining the entity entering the partnership so usually that's what we would do um, in this case we are presenting it as a very conceptual commitment to a property tax exemption partnership that would be specific to um, the 
following the policy in effect at the time that we are entering into the partnership. Meaning, they need a commitment for their August 1st tax credit deadline, but there are some changes happening in the world of income averaging that we're going to get into shortly that might affect our property tax exemption policy. And so we wanted to make sure it was flexible enough for you to decide later what the exact partnership would look like. Um, it would still come back to you, um, but this is kind of an interim step to help them with their application needs. Yeah, I think in the piece is, is if at the end of the day it doesn't work out, we don't have to do it. Mm -hmm. um, it's just letting them meet the requirements of the chapter application. And it's probably good to get into income average now. So mm -hmm. the the change condition, and I'm going to take you all back to Crispin Street when we started working that project. If you remember when we started working in Crispin II, we were looking at income averaging. And what income averaging is, and this gets right, this is also related to the market study that you have to do and where the units fit and what it looks like. But the, the component behind income averaging, sorry, I want to make sure I go through this. The premise behind income averaging is that what right now under typical affordable housing tax credit bills is really set at 60% annual. And you try to get what you can 30, 40 in that mix, but you can't go about 60% AMI. If you remember at Crispin 2, we were talking about the fact that the IRS has said you can do income averaging now, which meant you could go above 60% AMI that you you have to stay below 80% AMI. And you have a balance with things at 40 or 30. 30, right. So you're getting to the to the point of income averaging is that what you do is you use utilize the higher incomes of you know in that 60, 70, 70 to 80 to really generate more in that 20 to 30, 30 to 40, 40 to 50. So you get more down here, but you're offsetting that with the higher rents. Well, we didn't use it in Christmas too because the IRS never came out with that their guidelines. And so everyone was sitting there waiting to go, when are the guidelines coming out? Well, the guidelines have come out. And so now we're seeing people come in with the income average component to this. Um, this will be the only conversation in the Hover project. We're also looking at the same thing. And, and so there's some distinct, there's some differences in this. So when you look at income average, and you think, well, 70 to 80 percent, that's really market rate units. Maybe, not really. I mean, it depends on what you're doing. But again, you're leveraging the, in the rents here to get more of this. One of the distinctions is that if you're in one of the 60 to 70, 70 to 80 percent AMI units, you still have to recertify your income every year. So unlike a traditional market rate where you just pay your rent, that's it. In this case, you have to recertify every year, just like you would in a 40% AMI unit. So that's an, an additional burden that people who live in those units have to deal with. It is also a burden that lets you maintain the rent structures because the rent structures are always going to be in that range. It's not like you're going to have market movement in rents. So there's a there's a benefit and there's a negative for the renter that's in that section in the, in the average income. Um, every deal is going to look different as we've kind of gone through this and it really based, it's based on the variables that you're trying to, to, to reconcile you know, is the primary variable going to be increasing the affordability of this percentage that may be good you know, another variable is the type of units that you want to put in it's going to be a driving variable that may be it and there will be times where those two variables conflict with each other. So if you want to put in three to four bedrooms, it's going to be harder to maximize the percentage of affordability because the expense associated with building a three or four bedroom in terms of the amount of real estate that you're using. Because for every one four bedroom unit, you could get definitely two two bedrooms, or depending on the space, you may be able to get two two bedrooms and a one bedroom. So every average income deal is going to be different, which is this really most significant deviation in terms of how you look at this. Because it's hard to say, well, we're just going to do this. 
because the structure of every deal is going to tell you whether it's good or bad, and it's going to be dependent on a number of factors, which is based on the timing of getting into the real tech applications. That's work that we have to do with you all. So I wanted to kind of jump in and cover that because that's going to help you all frame your decision on this. So tapping onto that, um, and the reason why we're coming today with Atwood as more of a concept. Um, the, you can, the income averaging really does mean that you still, your, your final affordability for the property as a whole still has to be 60% AMI or below between when you average out all of the, the units. And so yes, the point is, yes, if you, there's a trade-off. Let's buffer with these 80% units, for example, to get those lower AMI units. So in theory, you're supposed to be able to get deeper affordability in certain units, but not have them fail the project. And that's the reason why they don't, most projects under traditional light tech don't have as many 30% units because they just don't, they don't support the finances. Um, so the reason this is coming to Atwood, Atwood is a proposed income averaging project. So Hover is looking at that as well. But our property tax exemption policy that we just updated in February, um, our calculation for our fee structure and the exemption that the project qualifies says all of your units at 60% or below. We wrote it that way because state statute requires the, um, the tax exemption to be proportional to the number of units or the, the percentage of the property available to low income people does not define low income. It leaves it broad. Um, so we've been researching across other housing authorities. Some have had to, to figure this out and some haven't yet. Um, everyone so far is going to allow the property tax exemption to apply to a full development up to 80% if it's an income averaging LIHTC project. Um, so again, the difference is we have qualified the full tax exemption for a property that's all 60% below. So now we have projects that are qualifying for LIHTC. Um, they're meeting you know, the CHAFA requirements for affordability. CHAFA also values having mixed income communities and deconcentrating poverty, which this does. Um, and so we just need to look at our policies and decide at some point coming forward, we'll bring it back to you, um, whether we modify our calculation to, pro to make an every unit tax exempt up to 80% or not. So that's why for Atwood, we're coming forward with the concept now, let us propose, um, still researching, still discussing what this could do, um, and then we would bring back a property tax exemption policy update for you to consider, at which time these income averaging projects would then set in stone what their partnership looks like. Hmm. So, uh, I may not have heard you correctly or interpreted you correctly. Um, you said that the tax exemption policy does not define low, low income? The state statute. The state is statute. Mm -hmm. What happens if you qualify under CHAFA, under LIFEC, <coughs> and then the state with your project doesn't recognize it as a, as a low income since they didn't define it? So, the statute, yeah. This is, that is specifically speaking to the housing authority law, so it is in the context of housing authorities. Um, and so in the context of the exemption that we can give, uh, like I was talking about through the entity, that doesn't define what low income is. The, the housing authority law, and particularly that statute doesn't. LIHTC, CHAPA, IRS has all said, these qualify for the LIHTC credits. Okay. Um, okay. But our policy says 60. Because that's what we we read low income. That's you know Longmont has used sixty percent for LIHTC in the past. We used fifty percent for the city programs, um, and we were basically just we were making it. That's how you determine the proportion in our calculation. So that's how we were writing it. And then income averaging came out. Yeah. 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 <laughs> At the risk of making it more complicated, when you're looking at why they're wanting to, why they have, why they're looking at income averaging action. So, a part of it's to maximize the number of units. Let's say 50% AMI to get more to put some here. 
kind of teeing the conversation that we'll probably go more in depth in the development update is then in order to get financed, you have to do a market study. And basically what the market study is telling you in, in the financing world is what is the likelihood that you can lease up all your units at certain AMI levels. And if you remember during Christmas when we talked about Chapa stating that, I think it was Chapa that stated that we're pretty saturated at 60% AMI. We're seeing that in the market studies. And so they then have to, in order to make the project financeable, you have to really try to target where you're putting in the units where you have the lowest sort of inverse in the, uh, sort of looking for long, the capture rates. So the lower the capture rate, the more likely it is to be leased. And so um, when we're seeing, and this is, so in Boulder, what we're seeing is the capture rates are below 5% for 30s, 70s, and 80s, which means the likelihood that you're going to lease those is pretty high. They're nearly zero for 70 to 80 because there are no 70 to 80s that we're seeing in the community. Litex. Litex in Longmont. And then, um, the capture rate at 50% AMI is 30%, so to give you a sense of the difference, um, you have, you're reducing your rentability, the, the ability to rent the units at 50 because you know it's a good 25 points higher than the others. 60% AMI capture rate is almost 35%. Um, and so they're having to manage that in terms of making the project pass the financing test that the lenders bring into play. So you can start seeing where income averaging is becoming more of a discussion point in, in the lie tech world because, you know, especially here, is that if you see saturation here, then you're going to have to move here in order to make, make it more palatable or, um, you know, to the lenders as they're trying to, to figure out the lending. So that's another piece to this puzzle that, as I stated earlier in the pre-session, is something that's making us reevaluate, ask some additional questions on our housing needs analysis because we're seeing some things that aren't quite lining up. So the market study is incredibly important to all of this. And I know it's, you know, you're probably going, what are you all telling us? Because it took us a while to start bringing these pieces of the puzzle together. But you can see that, you can see why they're trying to use this, what the market study's doing, and, and it's really taking us this way and in, in, in really moving out of that 50 to 60 percent, or really more 60 percent than you say. Right. Basically, we're saturated at 50s and 60s, and we may not lease them very quickly, which is not good for cash flow. Our markets show that we, we knew we needed 40% you know, and below. We've seen that in studies for several years. Um, we need those and they will rent up quick because there's such a need. We're also seeing that um, this, since income averaging is so new, there are no income restricted 70 and 80% units, which again, the benefit of that is amongst many things, you're not subject to rent increases that are unpredictable. You, it's very much more stable housing. Um, so, and, and if I can add to this, remember, I think it was a year or so ago, maybe prior to um, Councilmember or Commissioner McCoy joining us, as we were talking through affordability, I think we looked up and said, it wouldn't surprise us in a few years if on the housing ownership side, we look up and go 80 to 100% is shifting into that capital A on ownership. We said, wouldn't surprise us that's going to occur in the rental market too. That's what we have to start digging into because we think, and I'm going to preface this by saying we think that a lot of our 70 to 80 or 60 to 80 inventory in our community are probably older units and all the newer units that are coming on are sliding out of that range and the lower rents are higher. And so 
we're going back on the housing needs analysis to say, carve this up for us. Show us what it looks like in new units, and show us what it looks like in our historical inventory, because if we find that that's in fact what's occurring on the new units, that's just the canary in the coal mine to tell us that the rental margin is now going to be significant in that 60 to 80 because there's no units coming in to fill that. Mm -hmm. So those are the additional questions that are actually coming out of what we're learning in the market study that's now starting to inform a broader conversation. And to add on to that, we still want to see what our like, average rents are in the city because that's the people. That's what people have. They're not going to go to new or old. They're going to go to what they can afford. So that's the people. So we want to see that. But when when that is including both old and new stock, all we can we can affect change on new stock from here on with policy and what we choose to do. But we don't have control over existing stock. And so we need to know that differentiation to guide policy. Um, so, so a question again. When you say that you think it's going to go to the sixty to eighty percent um, will that be defined uh, through HUD as the next market for low and lower income? Because my understanding, well, to your question, that the market is saturated, you think, in the 60% uh, AMI. Can you, because of what you got your tax incentives for and CHAPA, everything that you got funding for, can you reduce that in house 40%? AMI, and does that change your affordability to run your? I, I'm I think I think they I think they were regulated. So HUD sets HUD calls eighty percent AMI low income. Oh, they do. They okay. do. Um, for most places, separate that between for sale and rental market. In our area. Well, at least in the state of Colorado, 60% and AMI below is traditionally what rental oh, okay. rental um, tax credit projects were capped at. And then really, like for our programs, our down payment assistance goes up to 80. So we've been looking at this 60 to 80 range as a mm -hmm. for sale market, even though that is changing, and 60 and below is rental. And then further in Longmont, because our prior housing data showed us that 60 was saturated, for the inclusionary housing programs, council chose to set it at 50 and below because we knew 50 and below is where we actually need the units. We don't need them at 60. Okay. And CHAF is now sliding to 80%. Oh, right. That's yeah. what that was. Yeah. That's that's what was like. So that's the, yes. state, the state is now moving there, okay. which we still have a lot of work to do on this, but I wanted to tie all of these pieces together because it's hard funny. to look at this. You just go, well, what about this question? Mm -hmm. But it's related to income averaging, it's related to uh, market studies. You know, once we can dig into it, mm -hmm. as a policy perspective, we may have to come back and re examine the 50% number because we may see something else occurring mm -hmm. on, on that, for lack of a better word, that attainment piece. Yeah, but we, we've got to dig into that. So does Jeff keep up with HUD because um, that's all we know. Can we fund that at that level? Is we under? can for certain programs, yeah. Okay. Yes. Is uh, Brookwell a, a subsidiary of another company? Brookwell is a development company. Then they created this LLC is their subsidiary for this project. But overall, Brickwell is the developer, the MyTech developer on the project. You said this is a long time, long time developer. So there is a develop, long time Longmont developer that is now partnered with a LIHTC developer. Brickwell is the LIHTC. <coughs> um, differentiate, second question, just to differentiate capture rate from occupancy rate. Capture rate is your ability, is basically the, the market that you have to build the units. Occupancy rate is once you build the units, are they full? So it's more of what, what's your, 
if I'm saying this right, what's, what's the market that you have in your community to put people in the units as you're looking at the future? Occupancy is in the future and having people in it. So it's akin to addressable markets, excuse me. I was just offering a yeah. mm -hmm. I was, um, I was going to have a second question. Sorry, it's broken. It just went right out of my head. So, all right. So, so that's what I was going to ask. Uh, what you just described sounds to me like a ratio of market potential to numbers of units. So could I use ratio as opposed to rate? Um, I would say the market potential sounds right. It's, it's telling you if there's a market for this product versus occupancy is how well are you managing that project and turning over and re releasing. All right. So it's the, it's the number of potential residents or lease or lessors. PCs, PCs, lessees, in relationship to the number of units yeah. and whatever the price point is. Units. Yeah, that's what took me time here because it's the vernacular that they use is different. Is there any other discussion or questions? Can I have a motion into 2023 21? Resolution 2023-21. <laughs> can, can we also get direction to bring back the average income policy? Just to have that in a minute. Sure, we can do that first. In a, oh. After you in a second. Okay, so the motion has been to approve 2023-21. Was made by Commissioner Michael Perry, seconded by Commissioner Rodriguez. Uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed. So that carries unanimously. So we want to move to give direction to uh, LHA staff to bring back the average income policy. I'll move that we direct staff to bring back the income averaging policy. Property Second. tax exemption policy. Second. To consider income. It's the, okay. it's the property tax exemption policy to consider income averaging. Okay. Okay. So um, that's it. Yeah. I second. Mm -hmm. All right. So I ask that question. Is is this uh, for a discussion by the commission so that it's, as soon as we can discuss, discuss it as a month from now? We would we could bring back red lines based on research that we continue to do mm -hmm. and then bring that back next month. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I just wanted to get it like a timeline because it sounds like you're gonna have to be facing this pretty soon. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, they were, it's in front of us, so you know, we hope to have some to speak by the 18th. Okay. Unless there's an outlier that we come across that doesn't make sense. But we'll let you know. Okay, so the motion is good. Well, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Aye as opposed. And that passes unanimously. Very interesting. Um, a lot of work. So now we're at uh, the interim executive director's report. Harold, um, development of things? Uh, oh, no. Whatever. Yeah. Whatever you want to do. Are we going to do the uh, development updates first? Sure. Okay. So I'll, I'll start on those. All right. Um, so our first, our big news, Zinnia is closed, which you've you heard that by now, but May 25th, um, we did close on Zinnia. Construction is in full force. We were out there this morning and they are hauling a lot of old um, asphalt and doing a lot of grading right now. So um, that construction is anticipated to be 15 months, which means we would have lease up next fall, fall 2024. Um, and so, we're still we're still finalizing all of the paperwork associated with closing, but um, we're also moving into that construction phase. We're working to make sure residents are aware of what's going on, address safety issues on site, since you know we do have a whole building of people living right there next door. Um, so we're moving into new phase here. Um, next, we'll be preparing with all of the parties involved to plan our lease up process and um, nailing down our 
some more specifics on what we're going to do on our property management plan. Um, so just to, to recap on the property management plan, that is, an, a, this is the first time that LHA has entered into an agreement to be a third party property manager. So um, it's different than the rest of our LHA properties. And so that was its own agreement that we negotiated and we really uh, took that one very um, seriously to make sure we could rely on that going forward and try to anticipate as much as we could that's way down the road. So why is it different? Why is this project different than the other projects? It is different because, um, I can't remember who the model is, part of council. I think, again, everyone was council member McCoy. If you, if you remember when Fall River was being constructed and they had a gap they needed to fill in the balance sheet to 750000 the city actually stepped in with the affordable housing fund and purchased the property surrounding the suites to allow Fall River to go under construction. And so the way that deal was created, and it's created many, many issues, is that was prior to the city sitting in the role of the housing authority. So the way that was structured was we were agnostic in, in essence in the, how it was going to be built. And in many ways, based on I think what we were seeing at the time, felt that a different group may be more ready to do it based on all the challenges that the housing authority was dealing with. So that was this contract that sit over here. Based on how that was agreed upon with Element, the way that the housing authority, now that we're doing both, that we brought the housing authority into this was for the operations of the facility, economies of scale in that world, but then also the special limited partnership. So that's a big reason why this one's different and more like Atwood because of the way that that original contract was established in Element long before we took over the housing board. So I wanted to clarify that. Thank you. Okay. Um, next, I wanted to give an update on how we're doing with Hover. So we are gearing up for that tax credit submittal August 1st um, application. Uh, we have, we just got that market study Friday. That's what has been part of this uh, discussion over the last few days. Um, so it's very encouraging. Our market study looks great. Um, and then we also got word on all the other developments across the state that are submitting for tax credits at the same time as Hover. Atwood was one, so those two will be um, in the same bucket being considered. And then um, generally it seems like there is more applications than average, but not by a long shot. So there's more competition than average, but um, they do think that there are certain aspects of this project that are not being hit with others. And so they're hopeful, but there's still about three and a half applications to every one possible award. So, and that's not too far off of normal. Um, and that's why sometimes it is common to go back for a second time if you're not successful. Um, other than that, we're in full concept design. We're getting some really great visuals of what the property might look like. And we're on, on July 18th in our next meeting here, we'll bring some of those visuals and we'll, there's going to be several October items coming to you that day to prepare for that tax credit application. Um, then if there's any questions on Hover, I'll pause. So Hover on income averaging is, is going to look different than, as we're looking at, will look different than Atwood because remember Atwood's one and two bedroom units. Hover's one, two, three, and four bedroom units. So to the point that I made earlier, that variable starts shifting how you look at the affordability piece because, you know, there's a point then it's likely in that conversation that we're going to have to weigh those two variables against each other in terms of three and four bedroom units versus percentage of affordability because it just takes up more space. And that's, a, that's what starts adjusting the financial side. I'm um, just out of curiosity, is the um, child care center out on over? It is in at the moment. Um, we are seeking, seeking gap funding. <laughs> We've got meetings set up with people all over the state, it feels like, in the next couple of weeks to talk about um, gap funding opportunities. Okay. So it was out? Yeah, I know. And then it went back in because we were, they had, uh, you know, Shannon 
is made aware of some foundations and others that are interested in it. Right. This project, for the reason that the foundations are interested in it, is because it's unique mm -hmm. in that there's not many housing projects, if any, that are family and looking at this component. So a lot of them will do early childhood, some will do housing, they haven't really done both, so that's intriguing to them. We also think that makes the tax credit application more viable. Mm -hmm. Now, all that being said, August 1 is the deadline to apply. So we're going to go through another iteration of, because you have to have all of your capital stack in that application. Or maybe another iteration where, for some reason, the foundations can't move fast enough, we may have to pull it out, but hold it, because I think we can put it back in. We could. For sorting that out, but we could hold it as a as a block and then say that it's self funded and then back fund after the fact. But there's nuances to that. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Um, and then the last key update I wanted to give on, is on the potential sale of the building at six fifteen Main. So this is the building that's not currently leased by the Center for People with Disabilities. We've been negotiating with them um, about. The purchase of that property they're very interested um, and in July and again in July's meeting it's going to be pretty busy um, we're going to be we're finalizing right now a draft purchase and sale agreement for your consideration and then an MOU for services that they can provide the LHA as part of our negotiation on the, on the, the sale of the property so that is all um, working perfectly right now it's right next to Village Place. So to, to your goal that you all set for us six properties I think within five years, um, we're directly involved with three that you've heard about and uh, Crispin and Zinnia and Clover. Um, we've now connected to a fourth that if that can go, um, again it's facilitating those units. So there's four right there. Um, and then um, we bring the property issue with rural, rural mobile homes to be for affordable housing. That's coming into play. We're probably going to hold a little bit on that because mm -hmm. we think there's value in the first main transit solution and transit oriented development and, and trying to figure out how that works. So um, I think we're, we're making pretty good progress on the goal at six and hopefully we'll get the next two going soon. Uh, we started, we set that goal in, in mid-2022, one year ago, July. Amazing what you did. And that's not housing authority, that's actually the city that owns it. Mm -hmm. And so the stormwater fund owns it now, and then the affordable housing fund's going to purchase it from the stormwater fund. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, no, nobody's contacted us in any of that. Okay. Well, there, there were many things about the installation for it, and the, the uh, being informed about several aspects of, of the deal. Their goal apparently is, is to slow or stop the development of the person. Mm -hmm. Yes, and again, it's in the So the, the plan for oil was outlined in a city council informational item that came to you on June 6th mm -hmm. on the council side. Um, so basically, the plan is to land tank at this point so that you can have a nice, you know, um, rolling set of developments and to make those calls about how it plays into. Yeah, one of the things that you will probably see both as the housing authority and potentially as the city council. So we're, we're maxed staff wise, mm -hmm. and uh, we're, we're looking at 
all the development work. And so we, we, were, we were evaluating how we can bring on some additional development positions. And um, what we've realized based on the money we're putting into the affordable housing fund and the fee and blue that's coming in, we actually have enough money to, to support that, but the financial policy doesn't allow us to do that. And so why it, it's going to toggle both sides of the equation is because um, the benefit is to the housing authority and the development staff to help get these projects moving and the capacity to potentially do one more maybe down the road. But it's connected to this other side. And so I've asked Molly to work with Teresa and Budget in terms of what we can do, what finances are available so that we could potentially create that position now and in connection with the affordable housing fund and then move it forward in the future. Uh, because they're they're max. We can't take any more uh, based on the current workload. So we're evaluating how to bring people on pretty quick. So Tom, is it your question about how we do it on the development and in reference to how we treat it to I, I carry around the I take both of the jackets everywhere I go. They're in that portfolio, and I keep thinking, one of these days, uh, we're going to return to these and take stock of where we are, what progress we've made, what have we learned, what needs to be refreshed, that there are some of the objectives, some of the that happens, that the dates have already passed, right? So, in some ways, it's out of date. But it, it would, maybe I'm the only one that cares about this, and I just need to sit with Molly and get it up. Um, I'm not suggesting a retreat, so I'm not trying to add in the workload, but but if um, it would be helpful to me if somebody took that and you could turn it into a landscape document and say, here's what we said we'd do, here's what we've done. This no longer applies, it does apply, here's where we're at. Something to keep this current. Otherwise, it's we spent a day, came up with pretty good stuff, and we've never looked at it. Now, well, you we, look at it all the time, I'm sure. We have not. We, we did go over an annual report at, in January showing the progress that we made in 2022 and what the focus for 2023 would be. Well, I think it was actually the one we missed. Oh, well, yeah. time. So I can provide that. Yeah, I'd be there. And then, I mean, already things are happening so quickly that that's six, we're six months out from that. Um, it's our time already have updates to provide. I, I'll, I'll, if there was a, I'll go back and watch the recording of the meeting. Uh, January meetings. I only remember because I think we were coming back and we knew you were going to be gone and we were presenting that that particular. It was on June thirty first. No, it was. It was. I think you. It was. Mm -hmm. I, I, I was out of town for a week the last week of January. And it's in there. January 31st. I was calling the January 31st. No, the document. Where are you looking? Um, it was under our uh, Longmont meeting view. This portal. Right. Yeah, front of Send me a link. Just send me a link. Yeah, we'll send you a link. Oh. So, Molly, you for next step two. Great update, um, yeah. So as you can see, um, we have raised occupancy up to 95%, um, so one of the highest since I've been here. Um, I think a lot of this is due to how we did change our waitlist procedures about a month and a half ago. We have um, Diana, our admin assistant, managing all the waitlists. She's calling as soon as we get a notice. We're trying to pre-lease these units. Um, going through the current statuses, I'm actually going to do an update more of today, not even as of when I did this report. So, Aspen Meadows neighborhood, we uh, now have five vacant. Um, one's been down for meth, and we're going to probably have two more down for meth. Um, and two others are pending rentals. Aspen Meadows Senior is in that we had six vacant. Um, we do have six vacant, but five of those are now rented as of this morning, and just one. Um, not leased. Fall River has just the one unit down from Meth, but that's already pre-rented and that should be back online on June 15th, so they will be 100% occupied by the end of the month. 
Carson and Lodge, um, she has pending applications for both those units. Her main focus is getting ready for a REAC inspection with HUD tomorrow. So HUD will be out there doing the physical, going through all the cabinets, closets, everything and anything for probably about six to eight hours. Um, the suites, we have just four vacants and three of those are down units. Um, the one other, the one rentable unit is already rented, it's an LHA unit. So once that's rented, all of our available units are filled. It will be the highest occupancy the suites has had in three plus years. Um, Spring Creek has no vacancies at this moment. And then the Briarwood and Village Place we currently are not leasing at due to pending sales. Any questions on the occupancy? What, just out of curiosity, what is making the occupancy go up? Is we have more units available? Are people actually? We've changed our procedures in house so because we did have some stagnant wait lists that we were working off. So we did open up. All the wait lists are now open. We are not closing them. Okay. So that if one. For Aspen Senior, for example, we called 55 people trying to get a rental and not one person to. So we're just leaving those wait lists open. So if somebody walks in and they're on the wait list and they have a voucher or they move next week, we're trying to get them processed and in a unit. And it's not specific to a uh, development. Like if they wanted to live in Spring Creek, for example, that's no vacancies there. So will you you allow them to go somewhere else? They can apply for whatever properties they want. So okay. we have a wait list for each property currently. Okay. So because each property has different AMIs, different features, different layouts. So some don't want to be on the west side, well, some want the east side, some want you know. So okay. they get to choose where they're at. We have I'd say probably half of our wait list are on every wait list applicants. So okay. Kind of get the first available. Yeah, okay. so, so they can get the first available. All right. Thanks. So, property updates. That's you too. That's me. I'm very short this month. Um, we still group moving from the Super to Mayo events, but Susan, Sp Susan Spalding and the mediation team have been out doing our coffee and conversations, and it's been great, amazing resident feedback after these meetings. Just they're learning a lot. We're doing fair housing with the residents, but we're letting Susan teach it, and she's kind of going through reasonable conversations at the same time and what. Property management has to deal with why we do what we do, why we say what we have to do with, deal with, and how we deal with it. And she gives the laws and the situations going all the way back to Martin Luther King and civil rights on some of these fair housing things. Mm -hmm. So it's making the residents understand where management comes from when we say, no, we can't do that, or no, we have to treat you like we treat your neighbor. And it's been kind of eye opening for the residents, and we've gotten a lot of great feedback from those. And those are continuing this week at two more properties. Um, everything else I think I've basically gone over with. Um, the only biggest thing happening at our property is Village Place. They're very upset that we took away their, uh, their assigned parking. They got a one-year warning, but this is all leading up to resyndication because um, we need to have spots available, move people around, spots for construction dumpsters here and there, surveying, you name it, but we just wanted to have flexible parking spaces. And make it consistent with the rest of the properties. Well, and if you all remember, that was the property where previously, probably unbeknownst to the board at the time, um, pre us, the, the property manager was assigning parking spots, and, mm -hmm. but also assigning ADA parking spots, which you're not allowed to do kind of ADA law. And so, you know, we had a bit of an upheaval when we started it. We said, okay, Point, we're going to give you a year, but we still got to do it. We're now transitioning into it, getting ready for the resignation. And probably some of those conversations with Susan Spalding has helped you yes. let them understand the reason. It actually was very beneficial at that property because she went through a reasonable accommodation and what qualifies for a reasonable accommodation where we can grant residents who need a closer parking spot and assigned parking spot, it just can't be an ADA. So we, we have seen a few reasonable accommodations and we're treating them just like we do all the other properties that submit the same request. Good. All right, we're done with property updates, public health and safety updates. 
right. So calls for service have actually taken a dip, which is that's real good, I hope. Um, <laughs> it seems like a lot of our problem, um, you know, I wouldn't say folks, not necessarily problems, but a lot of them have resolved themselves, so that is good. Um, we will now, I know Molly filled us in last time when I was absent last month, but uh, the ROI with uh, MHP. So that document is completed, it's in MHP's hands, and it actually had uh, started from Andy Feaster, the sergeant of our core unit. So I've been working with him and have that document listing several um, different entities for folks to sign off of for release of information from both hospitals to the school district to uh, public safety to LHA and we did this for many reasons um, but, and I'll give one example so we have uh, we have a person that's having some significant issues calls for service are out are crazy um, property management has some information public safety has some information MHP has a lot more information and really you know just us asking the question um, do you know if this person's on their meds we get the him and ha so basically this document is you know it's, it's still optional and MHP will present it to each each tenant and they'll be explained and at the end of the day it's to create a better situation for those people that get into this crisis mm -hmm. um, so that's great that that will be coming it's done it just needs to be presented basically to basically the LHA staff, it's a pretty simple document. So, can I ask a question here? This is a uh, paper document? Correct. Do you share information through a database so that you would know exactly where this person is and if they're on medication or they? So, due to HIPAA, that, oh, that cannot be shared. Okay. So, okay. M MHP would take that ROI and it would be, it would be verbal. Um, mm -hmm. Yes or no, this person. In. And there are some specificities to the document, uh, meaning that if this person doesn't want to discuss, maybe they don't want to discuss their medications. Mm -hmm. They're given the choice, mm -hmm. but they're also talk, it's spoken to them really through MHP how valuable it is to discuss that. Mm -hmm. So again, all options are on the table, but at least it's on the table for them. Okay. And if we don't struggle so much. Good. Um, and lastly, um, I know Harold had mentioned the P alert uh, meth detector. We, we received that. We've um, installed it in Village Place the last 24 hours. Got some readings there. Really, um, we're trying to figure out some a few inconsistencies with it, but now it's in Harold's office on a glass shelf, and uh, we're hoping it basically levels out to some normalcy so we have basically a place to start and so just to recap we put that in a unit that we know is positive and vacant um, and so we're testing because we have our recycle regular meth test process and then we have this that we can compare them. so it's not in it it's not in an occupied unit no okay. yeah. and if, if we placed the the decision was made to place it in a where where we already knew the numbers um, so, still working through the data on that to see if it registered the same numbers you came up with. Correct. And it did not. Or it did. That's to be determined. I'm still trying to determine that. It's gone. Did it? So we've got the we've got the feed. Yeah. So, the software system. So we've been looking at it, and so we saw it do. What it was supposed to do. It bought one of the things we really need 24 hours based on talking to them to see what it does because there's still residue that may interfere and so they wanted a longer period of time. So it did what we thought it was going to do originally, but then it just did something that I'm sitting there going, I don't know what it did. So I know somebody's going to the mouth, so there's no way. <laughs> but so we're going to be watching this over the next 24 hours and probably move it around the building so we can just kind of get a sense of what baseline is. Thank you. 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 Thank you
make sure that everybody's clean. So, Luke, so 